So I'm sitting here all by myself. Um, let me introduce uh, the panelists, um, the most important uh, participants uh, of this session. Let me start with uh, Jeremy Brown. The City of London Corporation appointed Mr. Brown, former Ministry of, uh, Minister of uh, State uh, for Foreign Affairs, as the special representative for the city to the EU in September 2015. And Jeremy Brown is not here. Unfortunately, uh, he fell sick. He is in Frankfurt. Uh, he tried to make it. He fell sick. I think we should let the conference organizers know uh, to extend our best wishes yeah, from the audience. Uh, may he get well uh, soon. But that results in much higher responsibility uh, to represent London and the UK uh, on Mrs. Uh, Catherine Braddock. Please join us here on stage. Would you want me to go? Oh, here, over here. Catherine Braddock is Director General Financial Services at the Treasury in London uh, since October 2016. So you replaced my former colleague, Charles Roxburgh. I did. Uh, as the Director General for Financial Services, Mrs. Braddock is responsible for all issues related to financial services, the financial system and financial stability uh, at the Treasury. Her responsibilities include uh, supporting the government's objective to promote stability, fairness, efficiency and competitiveness in financial markets leading the Treasury's relationship with the Prudential Regulatory Authority and the Financial Conduct Authority, and representing the Treasury on the Bank of England's Financial Policy Committee, and engaging with external stakeholders in the financial services industry, including consumer groups, industry groups, financial institutions, and today the Frankfurt Finance Summit. Let me introduce the next panelist, Mr. Bernd Geilen. Please join us on stage. Mr. Geilen stu studied economics and business administration at the University of Cologne. Uh, at that time already, he focused on innovation in banking. He worked for DSL Bank and Postbank in Bonn in strategy, Entrium Direct Bankers in Treasury, and managed the integration of Entrium into ING DBA in 2003. Until 2007, he led ING DBA's risk management and controlling in Germany, uh, then moved to Italy to build up ING's direct unit as CEO. Since October 2010, Mr. Geilen has been member of the management board of ING DBA, and in June 2017, he has been designated deputy CEO. Now, we also have a representative from the new economy uh, here with us, Thomas Grosse. May I ask Thomas to join the stage? Hello. Mr. Grosse is industry leader banking at Google Deutschland. Uh, he is responsible for cooperations and partnerships with banks and fintechs in Germany, covering all Google products and services. Prior to that role, Mr. Grosse was member of the management board of Wüstenroth Bank AG, responsible for sales, products, treasury and capital markets. Before that, he held various leadership positions at Deutsche Bank, including leading their online broker, Max Blue. May I ask Felix Hufeld on stage? Hello, Felix. How are you? No introductions needed, right? Uh, Mr. Hufeld studied law in Mainz and Freiburg and got his master in public administration from Harvard. Uh, worked for the Berlin Higher Regional Court, then the Boston Consulting Group, then Dresdner Bank, and held a number of uh, senior executive positions in the private sector. In 2013, Mr. Hufeld switched gears and became Chief Executive Director of Insurance Supervision at the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority in Germany. And in March 2015, Mr. Hufeld was appointed President of the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority. His mandates include uh, member of the Supervisory Board of the Single Supervisory Mechanism, and member of the group of governance, governors and heads of supervision, the oversight body of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. And last not least, Dr. Cornelius Riese.
Dr. Riese is member of the board of managing directors for DZ Bank in Frankfurt since 2013, responsible for group finance, strategy and controlling, as well as the local cooperative banks in Baden-Württemberg. Prior to that, Dr. Riese held leadership positions within DZ Bank yeah. and DG Hüb. He spent eight years at Accenture after his doctorate at University of Technology at Chemnitz and his studies of business administration at the University of Mannheim. Dr. Riese holds several supervisory board mandates at Bausparkasse Schwäbisch Hall, R&V Insurance Group, Union Asset Management, as well as VR Leasing. Wow, what a panel. A great group of distinguished <laughs> senior <laughs> professionals and executives, and I think a lot of inspiration uh, coming from our previous uh, speakers. And we just have about one hour to tackle um, the big questions around uh, the most promising strategic moves in banking in the face of first 10 years of intense regulatory supervisory and monetary policy activity and an uncertain way forward, at least what monetary policy is concerned. Second, drastic change as a result of, among others, digitization, new competition and market forces in financial services and a significant change in customer expectations and consumer and competitor behavior. And third, dramatic uncertainty as a consequence of unpredictable developments around Brexit and the political macro topics across the globe. Now, I suggest we try to reduce complexity a little bit um, and uh, start with a few simple yes, no questions um, to get a sense for you know, what the panelists think about different questions, but also what the audience thinks about some of these questions. Um, have you all had a chance to download the conference app? <laughs> Who has already? <laughs> because this is an interactive session. And, <laughs> oh, terrific. So I can just recommend try it again. I did it myself, and if I can do it, you can do it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> it's relatively easy. So please download the app, because the questions that will be asked, you can answer those to those questions with the app. So we also get a sense uh, for the group. Now, I think the organizers have you know, come up with a first test question, right? To make sure <laughs> we all you know, get familiar with, with technology. Uh, and Thomas, if something happens, you know, I'm sure... I'll try my best. <laughs> okay, good, <laughs> terrific. <laughs> so should we start with the first test question? Let me check uh, where I have it here. Is it on, on the screen? No, it's not. W wouldn't we want to put it on the screen? Oh, there yep. we go, terrific. So the first <laughs> test question is, imagine yourself as a well-off retiree where would you dream to spend your best years? So push number one, if you want to go to the Bahamas, push number two, uh, if you want to spend your time in a supervisory board of a cool fintech <laughs> with a pool table, obviously, yeah? Uh, or three, um, best years, my best years were in my 30s. Just a, just a test question. So <laughs> you're not held liable for your responses. <laughs> Let's see if the technology works. There we go, there we go, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Terrific. Good idea. So should we start with the first real question? I just came back from about one week of vacation mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in England. Beautiful time. I uh, had a, uh, the, the Pentecost service at, the, uh, 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 at, at, at Canterbury, at the Cathedral of Canterbury. Beautiful. I can recommend that to everybody. Um, terrific. And literally every conversation uh, I was engaged in uh, while in, in, in the UK uh, had some aspect of Brexit to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is somewhat in contrast to what I experience when I'm traveling across the continent. Uh, so my first question uh, literally is, um, how important is Brexit for us? Um, and I think we have a diverse group of folks on stage that would be really interested. So our first question here is, is Brexit among the top three strategic issues for banks operating in Europe? So please respond. And maybe I get a show of hands from the, from the panelists here as well. So let's take a look at the uh, potential responses here. Oh, we don't have the, the technology doesn't seem to be, there we go, okay. So is Brexit among the top three strategic issues for banks operating in Europe? If you think it is, it is yes, please raise your <laughs> hand here on the panel. Who thinks it is one of the top three, three strategic issues? Okay. Who doesn't think so? Okay. So we have a split vote here, three against two. What about uh, our audience? 
Okay, so there's a significant majority thinking that this is among the top three strategic uh, issues. Terrific. So let me start here uh, with uh, Ms. Bredick. How do you evaluate the Brexit issue? How important uh, is it these days uh, for the financial services industry in London? So it's um, for the industry in London, it's profoundly important um, and across all sectors, not just for banks. But I think it's a very interesting question to ask because there are plenty of firms in the UK that would say Brexit isn't my primary concern. And that's because if you are predominantly a domestic financial institution, you're concerned with the UK market, actually you may be relatively unaffected or at least the, um, the effects for you would be second order. And I think... Um, although it's also extremely immediate, so uh, people are very preoccupied with it because the end of the Article 50 period is now under a year away. I think when we look back in 10 or 15 years, we will think that actually, probably we will have spent the decade adjusting to other kinds of disruption and change in this market, at least as much as Brexit. And in particular, I think the combination of technology, demographics and customer demand will ultimately have a more far-reaching effect potentially for many financial services firms than Brexit issues, which affects some very large groups, but will affect them for a period and they will then probably move on. Listening to uh, President Dijsselboom earlier, uh, I got the impression that banks in the UK have made up their mind already to move all the people to Frankfurt, so why bother? Um, I don't think they've moved all their people to Frankfurt because the Lufthansa flight this morning wasn't as busy as you would expect if literally everybody was leaving London. Um, so I think what we see in the UK is um, an initial Lufthansa, set of Lufthansa. moves which are to do with essentially hedging the immediate risk to ensure that um, clients and uh, boards can be assured that uh, services can continue in a way that's not only undisrupted but completely sound um, from a regulatory and legal standpoint, I think. And that, that first phase of moves is, I think, relatively confined. Most firms affected, I think, then expect that there will be a second phase. And depending on the relationship that we achieve with the European Union, and of course our aspiration is to have a very close relationship on financial services, that will determine the scale of that second phase. And to me, that's currently unknown. Okay, okay. Mr. Grosse, Google is increasingly active in the financial services space. You're cooperating with many banks. Uh, you're offering Google Pay as a payments alternative to the physical uh, credit card as well as payments on the internet. If Google uh, was setting up a bank, uh, would you do so in London or in Frankfurt? Well, I, I did answer to your uh, earlier question, no, and uh, maybe to, to kind of bring some clearance, uh, um, I think there's some rumor about uh, Google having a banking license. Google does not have a banking license. We have uh, a money license in, in the UK, and we use it for our Google Wallet application to do peer-to-peer uh, -peer transfers. Uh, so we don't have a banking license uh, right now, definitely. And um, uh, coming back to, to your other question, uh, both the UK and uh, the European Union is a very important. Both are very important markets for Google in general, just not financial services. And so we would have to really make sure to be able to operate in both markets in general. So, uh, but uh, not from a banking perspective, but from a Google perspective in general. Okay, interesting, Mr. Hufeld, are you currently more concerned? with the implications of Brexit uh, on or, or the new rules of competition in the German financial <laughs> services industry? I, I think uh, the difference is I'm, I'm permanently concerned about the latter, and I'm particularly concerned about the former. Um, and and it, it, you know, Brexit is a, is a uniquely historical event, uh, which, which, which we have to deal with every single day currently. It won't go away anytime soon. Um, the matter of competitiveness of the German banking industry is, is uh, surely not a particularly new phenomenon we have to deal with all the time. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's both. We can handle two things at the same time, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Now let's turn to the bankers, uh, and let me start with the incumbent first, uh, and then turn to the attacker, uh, Dr. Riese. Uh, what <laughs> role does Brexit play on your strategic agenda? Uh, what are the things that uh, will make the strategic difference? What matters most for both future performance mm -hmm. as well as uh, medium-term health for DZ Bank, but also you know, for other uh, German incumbents like you? So first of all, when I um, take a very narrow, a very simplistic view uh, of this topic, um, then um, for DZ Bank, we have around 200 people 
uh, in London. We have two branches and um, for us, from an operational point of view, Brexit is at the moment more or less a non-event. Um, there is the process of reapplying as th a third country branch um, and that's a very structured process supported by the ECB, by Buffin, but as well by the local authorities in the UK, by the PRA. So taking a very operational point of view, it's close to be a non-event. But uh, I raised my hand in your multiple choice question uh, for it is among the top three priorities because there are some second round effects, some indirect effects. Mm. And for me, first of all, um, we have obviously many German customers and, and for many German corporate customers, especially out of, uh, out of the industrial sector, the whole Brexit topic is a key priority. And it might also change their risk profile, which is an important topic, obviously, for banks. And the second point is the kind of political arena, the political topic. Um, we heard it before, the whole future of the European Union, policy making in the European Union, the restart of the sovereign debt crisis. That's a huge bunch of discussion. And in this discussion with the UK and with the Brexit, a voice of sense is getting lost in this whole discussion. So I basically see it from an operational point of view for our institution. It is not a key priority at the moment, but those indirect effects on a general economic level as well as on a political level are, um, have, have a very long-term effect. And so I think it's among the top, the top priority as well for us. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Geiler, does that hold true for ING? You have a background in risk management and controlling. What about the implications of these secondary effects of of an institution that has grown significantly also in their credit portfolio over the past years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I said no to the, to the question because at the end, uh, if we talk about banks here in Germany, we have 1,500 banks for, and for most of the banks, it has not really indirect impact being most of them uh, really local banks. And in, in so far, it's, uh, it's uh, really the second round impact that, uh, that is really concerning. It's, uh, it's a really lose-lose situation for the economy and also in, in general for the society that uh, Europe going to break up between, between continental and, and uh, UK. And the second, the second round, uh, uh, of course, we added uh, some years here in Germany also the, the wholesale banking. We are not that much exposed in, in, in UK with our activities. Uh, but of course, a lot of a lot of German companies, and uh, my colleague already pointed out, have a, have a really uh, impact, have additional uncertainty. What is what is really coming out of the uh, um, breakup, and, and so far, that is uh, that is something which is having an impact on us, definitely. Uh, but it's also on with our bank. It's not in the top three agenda. Okay, definitely yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, you pre re represent the innovative leg of the German banking industry, the European banking industry on this panel. Um, your institution has shown significant progress uh, towards what you call a digital and an agile uh, organization. And we'll, we'll talk about that. You view agility and the ability to quickly adjust uh, to market movements as a core element of your value proposition and operating model. Let's maybe briefly touch upon the issue of uh, digitization. Uh, and let's again kick off our discussion with a simple yes, no question. So may I ask uh, our uh, organizers here to put the next uh, yes, no question uh, onto the screen. Question would be, will digitization lead to more homogeneous business models in banking? In other words, Will all banks look the same once they're all digitized? Um, and will we see, as a consequence, a trend towards large, globally dominating financial players, i.e. the Facebooks and Googles and Amazons in the financial services industry? Now, these were three questions. Let's, again, focus on one question. Will digitization lead to uh, more assimilation in the banking business models? Uh, will banks look all the same in the end? Now, what about the panelists here? Opportunity one, uh, answer number one was, um, it's hard to read, right? The, f the front mm -hmm. end might look the same, yeah, but the rest will still look different. Who's in, in this camp? Nobody? Second, no banks will focus on different uh, parts of the value chain uh, over time. One, two, three, okay, four. And last uh, answer, there will be uh, no banks anymore. We don't think so, don't think right? So. We don't think so. So what does our 
our audience think. No banks will focus on different parts of the value chain. Th so there is a future for a thriving, colorful banking industry uh, in Germany. Um, that should give us confidence. Um, Dr. Riese, what's your perspective on the future competitiveness of legally independent, locally operating and this relatively small cooperative banks in an increasingly digitized world? So I think the question, um, I mean, the, the answers were quite uh, difficult to understand to some extent, but I think the question was, uh, will the banking market will become more heterogeneous or remain heterogeneous? And I think there's some empirical evidence. Uh, first of all, there's some empirical evidence in the European banking market. The markets are very different. When you look at France, you have more centralized oligopolistic banking market, very different in Germany. And uh, then you also have some empirical evidence in Germany over the last 10, 15 years. And I think there have been two winners in the banking market. Um, that was more or less the digital only direct banks and the network saving banks and um, uh, cooperative banks, which I'm representing. So however you want to define heterogeneity, I think in the end, uh, specific segments of the market have uh, gained market share over the last, uh, over the last years. <coughs> My perception is um, this will continue. There will, will be in retail banking a differentiation between digital only banks and omnichannel banks. Uh, what makes me optimistic for our organization is that we serve both customer segments. We have in our organization digital-only banks, uh, such as Sparda and PSD Banken, and we have the Volks- and Raiffeisen Banken as omnichannel banks. And I think I'm optimistic that they will, uh, that we will, as an organization, continue our success because we have three key points uh, for the Volks- and Raiffeisen Banken. We have, in the end, at the front line, the entrepreneurs, the entrepreneurs at the front line, at the customer front line, they decide the main topics. We don't have central McKinsey pro projects that somehow uh, redesign branch networks, but this kind of distribution management is, is done at the customer front line regionally. The second point in this whole discussion around digitization, we have in many times a retail focus. So I think omnichannel banking will be ar around the combination of retail banking, private banking, and corporate banking. And especially in corporate SME banking, there will remain a strong regional elements. And the third point for our organization is the division of labor. So in the end, the local banks will focus on serving the customer. And at the same time, it's uh, important to have central organizations that do the IT, shared service, product provision, marketing, etc. And so I'm quite optimistic that this group, uh, this cooperative group will remain as successful as it, at, as it is and has been over the last years. So the core design choice for the German banking industry is local entrepreneurship versus centralized technology providers. Mr. Geiland, is that the choice you went through when you designed ING for the future? Yeah, for us it was uh, not really changing the strategy. At the end, at the core, at the core, what we are doing is to deliver quality, and we have to be relevant for the customer. And that is that is the long-term questions: Are banks going to be relevant for the customer? Yeah. Uh, if you are not able to deliver service to uh, to have an add-on for the for the customer, they will not pay for us, and they will always get a push against the banks. And so far, that was the, the key the key point when we started. Also, now the way to agile working to think uh, the environment gets more and more complex. We heard it before. And uh, we, are, we are a really regulated uh, sector in the economy, and that will also not change in the future. There was also a clear perspective that we heard before. And having, having that environment of, of a really dense regulation and a lot of uncertainty, um, you have to do something. And at least in the, in the flexibility that you still have within this regulation, you have to create an organization that can react very fast and, uh, and can uh, take res responsibility from end-to-end -end processes to the customer. That is a different, different way that, uh, uh, compared to the organization we had in the last 15 years. We have been quite successful. Uh, but two years ago, we thought uh, that was very successful in the past, but will it, will it bring us to the next level? 
and then we start uh, uh, step by step looking at a new new organization. We're currently in mid of the process to get to the uh, agile agile organization. Just just designed the delivery part. We as we as the uh, the forstand of the bank we. Uh, uh, decided not to have offices anymore. We did not have really offices before. We had some aquariums, uh, but now we have one big table, and I think that is uh, that is unique here in, in in Germany. Our colleagues in Netherlands they did it uh, three years before, and uh, we are now in the middle of the the process. And um, one might say agility is uh, is uh, the opposite of stability, and, and all the uh, all the banking regulation is going for stability on a macro level and also on a, on a banking level, on a bank level. But uh, at the end, agility is really, uh, really disciplined approach. At the beginning, I would think there's a little bit more work around, uh, but it's really bringing small teams together from IT to user experience people to data people and make them responsible to develop certain steps in the bank. And we are pretty convinced that we're going to be faster uh, than the competitors in the future. And to be fast is, uh, I think, a very, very important thing for the future. And you are using, in addition to, yep. to Agile, you are using a technology-driven, a digital approach uh, towards the market. You're luring away a number of customers, big numbers of customers, from the traditional incumbents, like the cooperatives, like the Sparkassen. Uh, business has been growing fast, yep. um, so competition uh, seems to be uh, very intense. Mr. Hufeld, are you concerned uh, exactly for that reason uh, with regards to the financial stability? Is an agile organization like that making the German banking system more fragile? Well, it, it depends, of course, on what exactly is supposed to be agile. Um, if it's meant to increase um, uh, services to the clients uh, uh, be much faster on project management and redesign the whole organization. Um, that's perfect, of course. Um, I wouldn't be particularly in favor of agile capital management and agile risk management. Um, that indeed, I think, is something which should remain slightly more stable. And I think that's not what uh, uh, Mr. Gein or Mr. Riese or others have in mind. Um, and, and in that sense, um, it, it's just a whole new managerial setup of, of enter a new era uh, by, mean, by applying means which had not been available, say, 10, 15 years ago. And, and of course, that's perfect. The degree of change which you have been indicating, uh, in my view, is going to be brutal. Um, I think, particularly from a German point of view, Jerome Dasselbaum called it fat banks. I'm afraid that's exactly right. There are far too many fat banks sitting around. Um, that has nothing to do with size. It's, it's about the economics of any particular bank. We have far too many um, banks who still look like sort of large, medium-sized or small universal banks. I think that's not sustainable. Um, I think the trends you've been asking for, digitalization and others, will enforce much more focused business models um, uh, going forward. So, of course, there will be associations and structures who can afford to be comprehensive. But many others, because you ask the question, is it just uh, uh, centralized technology managers versus uh, uh, physical affinity to wherever the client sits? Um, that's one dimension. Um, another one is, is, are you a product specialist versus are you offering 1,000 products? Um, so there are all sorts of different dimensions along which you have to focus. I, I'm expecting, that's of course not a supervisory statement, it's, it's an expectation with regards to markets developments, um, that the need to become more focused it will be eminent. Um, because cost levels we are having, um, in, particularly in Germany, are quite simply unsustainable. Um, so whatever it takes, it has to go down. Are you recognizing some of these discussions when you look at the... Yeah, British so banking industry. It's a very interesting debate to listen to because, of course, we have such a, a complex sector in the UK. We have a huge number of international banks serving clients all over the world, and then we have our own domestic market. And if I think about the changes that we've seen in that sector over the last, say, decade or, or so since the crisis, I think 
We've seen change in bank business models driven by um, regulation and the crisis very acutely, um, then by sort of the continuing, e continuing economics of the business, which has driven considerable cost savings. We had a move in the UK to open our market to more competition and encourage the authorization of new banks. And what we saw there was the emergence in the UK of a, a large number of um, smaller banks who did indeed, uh, and, and some still are, playing in niche parts of the market. And then when they um, achieve scale, some of them then get hoovered up by, by the larger banks. I think the interesting, I found this quite a difficult question. I've just been turning it over in my mind as we've been discussing it, thinking about the difference that technology might make in this market. We're just, um, with the introduction of open banking in the UK, seeing the first products introduced in the UK that enable customers to share all their banking data with third parties to enable those third parties to help them manage their financial affairs. It's one of the most, a lot of the fintech change we've seen in the UK, and, and we are leaders in fintech still in the UK, has been at the, at the back end. It's been a lot about payment systems. It's been about the way businesses operate. This is very customer facing, and I think what will I th determine the answer to this very interesting question is the way the customer responds Responds because this kind of banking, where you are given the opportunity to take control of your data and use it with other businesses, will encourage consumers to think about banking less as a utility, which they still do in the UK, and more as a service. And the question in my mind is how widespread will that be? Will that be for customers with enough money for whom it makes sense, in which case I don't think it would be transformative, it will be a certain part of the market? Or is this the beginning of a complete change in the way customers interact with their banks? And then I think you will see the emergence of more focused business models as, the, if you like, the, the customers become more self-sorting and demand a more focused business model. It seems like this increased focus on customer interaction is one of the drivers of the agility and the agile approaches uh, in, in banks. So building on what you said, is agility at ING focused on the customer front end and stability focused on risk management and capital management, balance sheet management? Is that the distinction that you're making or how, how does oh. agility taste and smell in, uh, in, in, in ING DBA? No, is that are not two poles, agility and stability. We have, we have a framework and uh, on that we have to deliver. You have the minimum requirements, we have all this regulation and that simply do not change. And the first, line, the first line also has to comply with all this regulation. But how to deal within this regulation, the entire team, uh, that, is, that is really a, a, a mindset change. Yeah, bring the IT people, bring the customer experience people, the data people, bring them in small teams, and then give them a clear task how to go. It was, it was um, for many, many years, we have been quite good in managing big projects. But as bigger as we get, the more complex also the project management gets. And we try to get it back to, the, to, to, the, to small teams to clear their fine to responsibilities and then getting all the people that are uh, relevant for, for developing products or that have contact to the customer to create all these uh, agile, agile teams in triumphs and squads. And that is, uh, that is really first a mindset shift yeah, that you that you are responsible from the interface to the customer till the delivery in the operations. And at the end, you're also responsible for the risk cost because you decide to which customer deal you do I really want to give the, the loan. And uh, in so far, you have that the entire, the entire responsibility. And uh, that, in that approach, we did not have in the past. We never had, uh, till now, we never had any profit center in the bank which also has, to be, uh, has been completely uncommon. The board had the responsibility for the profit, but we had no one in the bank in retail uh, that had any responsibility for, for a profit center. And having now 4,500 people and, uh, and uh, being at least the biggest savings banks also in Germany, we also have to develop, of course, the organization to get more uh, delegated responsibilities. So you're so saying yeah. you used agility also to strengthen the responsibility Absolutely. In, the Absolutely. in the banking Absolutely. Uh, operations. Yeah. Mr. Grosse, uh, if there's one thing Google claims to be good at, it's, it's agility and the way it manages data. We'll come to the data topic. Let's stick maybe uh, with the agility topic for, for, for one more minute. D does that feel and smell and taste the same inside Google as it does here for, for ING? 
So I think uh, Google is definitely in a different position, right? So we, we started with agility. So our core is probably agility. And now Google has become a big company as well. And so we are probably more struggling keeping that agility going. So it's like uh, from a different, we come from a different angle. Um, you, you asked about taste. I would say uh, uh, it would maybe taste sometimes as a zoo in Google. <laughs> Uh, um, because there's a lot of things going on. So uh, we have a lot of agile teams uh, having a lot of uh, product, product ideas. I think uh, one of the main strengths is definitely uh, developing new ideas and bringing them out fast. And, but when you're big, uh, it could also be a certain disadvantage because I think uh, end users sometimes are a bit confused about all the Google offerings. So we kind of have probably have a contrary effect there, we as Google have to also make sure that people still understand what Google is all about. So, but how we are handling it is that we often have for, for uh, certain solutions two or three different products, be it Inbox or Gmail for our mail services, um, uh, we combine our payment solutions. So we are trying actually different solutions for different uh, customer segments and then see how that plays out. And then maybe after two or three years, combine those efforts into one solution. That's probably the approach we are you're taking. I understand you're currently uh, piloting a cooperation with uh, probably the most or second most traditional banking institution here in Germany, the German Sparkassen, uh, on the use of Google Assistant in facilitating bank transactions. Uh, very interesting. So a very agile uh, innovation, technology-driven uh, uh, company cooperating with the German Sparkassen on that. H how does that feel? It feels good. I mean, we are really excited that that, that actually happened. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, the audience maybe doesn't know what this is about, so we have the Google Assistant, and you can actually uh, uh, use actions and incorporate other services with the Google Assistant. That the Sparkassen piloted uh, an option to actually check your current account information as well as do transfers out of your account. And I'm really excited about it because it's actually the first solution worldwide for Google. I mean, so the Sparkasten here in Germany were our first partner to, to try that with us. And so uh, I have to really say innovation and, 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 and quickness is actually possible as well here. Um, and uh, this is probably also the approach we are taking in general with, with, with banking and our t technology. Uh, I don't really see us becoming a bank, but uh, we, are, we really want a partner when it comes to new solutions to reach customers with our Google products and services. So, Dr. Riese, what's the response of the German cooperative sector? Uh, the cooperation with Alibaba? <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some competitive products in the pipeline or uh, already live. I wanted to add some point. Uh, to the whole agility discussion because um, from my perspective the, the the discussion is agility a new paradigm is it the silver bullet that solves all problems that an organization might have and uh, it's definitely very very necessary especially and that goes in the direction of your hypothesis uh, it's especially very important in the whole product development area and in, in customer-oriented area, but also in uh, process optimization areas. Um, but for, for us and for me, it's more one tool in the toolbox. Because uh, um, just to give you an example, we just had a large uh, merger project behind us over the last two years, which was a very large, basically, core banking merger project. Um, and in these situations, agility might help, but it's more classical project work in the end. And uh, there are some banks, probably not here um, uh, at this panel, uh, that need to bring back their 70-year-old retired people because uh, they need them to, uh, to, um, to manage uh, 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 their core banking systems programmed in COBOL out of the 70s. And there are business situations, there are IT issues uh, where Agile is not the silver bullet. And so for me, is. Agile working environments, inva innovation lab, uh, corporate universities, uh, process labs, those are more kind of tools in a toolbox uh, for managing just different business tasks. I see the energy level raising on the chair of Mr. Hufeld, so please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I see a very remarkable change in the way how we discuss such issues today versus, say, two years ago. Um, two years ago, the discussion was very much about fintechs take over and crush the incumbents and put them out of business. Um, today, it's much more about um, sort of emerging 
the merger of two worlds. It's much more cooperative. Um, the, some of the examples you just mentioned a moment ago, like Google and Sparkassen, there are many more examples like that, just show um, it, it, it just like incorporating a very different style and way of working, of course, uh, 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 with the incumbent capabilities of traditional uh, institutions and, frankly, brands. Um, which are established and do enjoy the trust of millions of customers. So, and w w will that leave everything unchanged? Of course not. But in a different way, it will change the way how banks or banking setups mm. will work fundamentally, but it's very much different from the either or kind of debate we had only two years ago. So what's emerging is a much more subtle process of corporation buying and merging or what, what have you. And do you feel that the you know, regulatory and supervisory process that we have now established over the past 10 years, is that still valid in that new world? Well, that's a great question. It's, it, today, um, we, medium to long term, the answer is no. Um, and let me give you one, one very specific example. The way we think about outsourcing, the whole concept of outsourcing, and that's, of course, not only true for a German supervisor, but for all supervisors around the world, is just based on a very old-fashioned concept that any particular banking institution is just doing what it is doing sort of anywhere 80 to 100% on their own. You know, the, so the value creation is very much embedded in that one institution and then on a very focused fashion, you take one item and source it out. And that's something we have to approve. That, of course, couldn't be further away from the today's reality or reality in five years or ten years down the road. It'll be a much more patchworky situation. The value creation of banks, like we've seen it in another industry, take automotive or so, will decrease dramatically. There will be there will be a whole scope of partners and, and, and outsourcers and what have you. So the way how we look at outsourcing will have to change. If we just continue to apply what we've been doing for the past 30 or 40 years, it's just incompatible. Um, having said that, though, it's not that easy to say what exactly we will do, because that's not a trivial thing. But because, of course, our ambition is to ensure reliability, in that sense, stability, um, compliance with legal norms. And so how to transform where we are today into something new is not, not a small task. But we are very much aware of necessary changes going forward. If I say we, this is heavily debated in the usual international fora, starting from the FSB level to European uh, uh, bodies and, and, of course, on a national level as well. That must be good news yeah. for the financial services industry in the UK and in, in, in London. So it's less about are my bankers sitting in London or in Frankfurt. It's much more about ways to cooperate in new ways using technology to you know, operate yep. on, a, on a European or even global level. Does that increase the degrees of freedom that you're thinking about when you're thinking about the financial services industry? I think, w certainly I think that one of the challenges we've been aware of since the summer of 2016 is that when we think about our future relationship with Europe, we think about trying to preserve a financial system and the structure of firms that existed in the summer of 2016 instead of thinking about where, where this sector is going and where our relationship with Europe fits into our wider program about what makes the UK competitive and, and where the sector goes. And I think one of the really interesting things listening to this discussion and particularly about agility is the challenges um, for regulators and public policy makers arising in financial services. If, as Felix says, there's a, raises a, a series of questions about how supervisors supervise and how they look at risk. For public policy makers, I think it, when we look at a lot of, increasingly, a lot of tech-related innovation, our first question is, what is this? What is this product because that helps or service because that helps us think about well how do we think about the risk and how should it be supervised and you know what are the components of a regime for it and you can make you know you can make anything innovative seem like something um, not so innovative if you simply elide or minimize the, the things that are new about it. You know, what's new about peer-to-peer -peer lending? Is it basically a different kind of fund? Well, if you think about it in those terms, 
you're not thinking about the risk. And so there are a lot of really interesting conceptual questions in policy as well as in supervision that are going to be presented to us. Um, if you look at the emergence and the, the very vibrant discussion in FSB and elsewhere about crypto assets, I think what I see is a very rapidly developing debate which started out with you know um how do we regulate it do we just you know do we do we do we want to just stop these assets existing to is it money at all is it an asset to how can we distinguish crypto assets or the or the products more broadly from the technology distributed ledger which has applicability widely across financial services but well beyond financial services and these are really intriguing issues and problems for, for policymakers and for supervisors. And as Felix says, I think, you know, the, the debate about them is starting absolutely at the kind of most international of international levels, um, because the nature of the world means that we are not going to, like, like um, environmental challenge, there is, it is pointless to think about these issues within borders, because they won't respect those borders. Yeah, yeah. And I think introducing another agent, yeah, like the Google Assistant into the bank customer relationship is fairly innovative, right? And it has probably profound implications on regulation and the way banking business is being done in the in the future. The second big topic, I think, is obviously data. I mean, Google Assistant uses data, voice uh, information that is being being used here. I think we should also talk a little bit about about data. Also, given the the, the, the Facebook discussion of the past uh, months, what what's Google's stance on using data, on using all that is currently being captured by the Google Assistant in 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 facilitating banking transactions? Uh, I haven't gotten that data question before. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't, but uh, to answer, so obviously GDPR is like the, it just got, li uh, uh, got live a, a couple of days ago. And this was one of, one of the probably uh, super big topics within Google. We have been working very hard for it for over a year with, I don't know how many teams uh, in Mountain View as well to, to be really be compliant. We think we are compliant. Uh, so, uh, obviously, um, um, to kind of broaden, broaden the answer, um, obviously for, for a lot of products and good services, you need to a certain extent data, right? So, uh, certain things like Google Maps, uh, um, uh, Gmail, um, the Google Assistant, and you if you don't have a context, it, it's really hard to provide a good service. So, within the, within the law and the regulation, uh, we, we are trying to, to provide the best uh, user experience by using data, yeah. And uh, another thing um, which is often discussed is uh, uh, Google doesn't sell data. So we use data uh, for, for our customers, but we don't sell data because we, we, uh, we use it to kind of make our, our products better. You don't sell data, but I think everyone who's using data knows how valuable okay. data is. Uh, Mr. Galen, you're using data uh, in, in your business. H how do you approach the increased sensitivity around the use of data, the value of data, the confidentiality of data, the, 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 the expected degree of professional approach in data management by banks. I, I, how would you describe that challenge? When I, when I started direct banking almost 20 years ago, the first day I had, uh, had a meeting with, uh, with my CEO at that time and I said, Bernd, and to think about direct banking is database banking. I said, okay, but for me it was not really clear what he meant, but over the next weeks it really developed. And uh, not, having, not having branches, you are completely reliant on data. On the marketing side, yeah, you have to measure everything. Is the campaign, is that uh, efficient? How are the CPOs? You do not have face-to-face, -face. you do not see immediately how a customer reacts. And that in so far the business model is completely based on data. Is aren't that always sensitive? Data no, because a CPO that is not a sensitive uh, uh, data also from the customer point of view. And uh, but uh, from the mindset, we have always been data driven, really rational, and and not doing stupid things. That has to be uh, has to be efficient, and uh, that is a part of the model. So far, data was always very key for us. Uh, and, of course, we are a bank and customers expect that we are treat their, their, their data because most of them is their data. And that's the first, the first part to understand. Also, the, uh, the, uh, the for Germany, not that new, new uh, data regulation. 
Um, and if you treat the, the data as their data, I think you already do 99% uh, of, of what you can do. Uh, is it always about the volume of data? No, it's, it's uh, how to get in a smart way the right data. And there are not that many drivers. If you look at, look at the customer behavior, and that is really relevant for us, there are a few, few really drivers in customer behavior which you can detect with more or less a few data. And I'm less concerned now on the, on the, on the GDPR, on the Datenschutzgrundverordnung, than more on PSD2, that also other institutions get with the consent of the customer now all of the access to the, uh, to the financial data. And the financial data that we have are, of course, very strong, very strong data. I remember we did, uh, I think two or three years ago, we did an, uh, uh, a joke in, in YouTube on the 1st of April. And, and we said, okay, uh, INGD by is there now establishing a partner, a partner portal. Yeah, and that was really super. The marketeers did a very good job. <laughs> and what, what do you think? The, the, at 10 o'clock, we already had three calls from other partner portals. Can we cooperate? Because we need your data. Yeah. And of course, they have a lot of data, but they do not have financial data. And financial data demonstrate a lot of uh, customer behavior. And uh, uh, if Google get them all, uh, that would be very hard for, for <laughs> bankers, definitely. So you said it's about quality of data, yeah. it's about responsibly dealing with the data. What about the local entrepreneurs in, in, a, in a decentrally organized group like, like the, the cooperative banks? Um, so how do so you deal with it? Yeah, so, so for us, I think we have uh, to be good in basically two parallel disciplines. The first one is um, we have to establish smart data sources uh, that are managed by legally different organizations, which is quite uh, quite difficult because in the end the client uh, needs to accept the fact that, for example, the Z Bank is giving data to a local cooperative bank or vice versa. So in this group of many legally independent organizations, uh, we have basically um, a smart data challenge, which in the end says we need to convince the client that this cooperative group as a whole is being kind of uh, the one that the customer wants to deal with. And the other new discipline is basically everything around data security. So I think this is a complete new management discipline, especially for banks that has been developed over the last, I don't know if you would have such a discussion three years ago, probably nobody would have been really uh, that much into the topic. Uh, and for us, basically, I talked about a division of labor before. We are currently establishing one data security center for the whole cooperative group, for 900 banks, for our group, and for the, uh, for the, for the central organizations. And this is also an area where banks need to partner. We, we had the partnering discussion before. We are partnering with uh, Deutsche Telekom. And I can just recommend everybody, because the whole topic of um, uh, seeing those kind of attacks and uh, how the sophistication of those attacks increases more or less day by day, this is something you cannot learn by PowerPoint, more or less. Uh, can just, I can just recommend everybody to visit such a center and to get a real-time feeling of what is going on there. Because talking about the three top priorities, I mean, in the end, we're probably then at more than three, but it's definitely uh, among the top five, the whole topic of data security. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned a, a number of additional disciplines need to be developed around data security. We heard new organizational concepts around agility. We talked a lot about technological platforms, mm -hmm. data usage. All of that points towards a significantly higher requirement with regards to capabilities, functional capabilities, much broader than, you know, when I started working in a bank in the, 80 in the 80s of the past century, um, th 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 we never thought about topics like that. So where did you, where do you get the talent from? Is it, or let me ask the question, is it easier to find that talent in the UK and in London or in Frankfurt or maybe in Berlin? So we currently we have a very um, we have quite a lot of people employed in fintech in the UK. It's, it's a sector, as I've said, that is increasingly in integrating with mainstream finance. And one of the reasons the UK has had such a successful financial sector for so long and tech sector is because we can attract the talent. Um, and uh, one of the issues that firms in the UK are therefore most interested in, particularly in this area to do with our, you know, our future trading relationship is the degree to which people can come in and out of the country. And therefore the ability, uh, you know, our determination 
to be able to continue to attract the best people is absolutely integral in this sector as well as other parts of, of, of the finance sector because you know people come to London because of the legal code because of the language because of the time zone and because of the skills um, and so we need to continue to be able to grow those skills but also attract those skills from elsewhere no okay. question so Gaida, do you still hire traditional bankers or are you hiring techies and psychologists only? Both. Both. Yeah, we have a lot a uh, lot of new profiles uh, like user access experience, uh, which I at the, at the end I did not know five years ago that there also uh, uh, Universi universities offer these uh, this kind of studies, uh, uh, but there we, we hired a lot. Um, but we also still have traditional bankers or, or people that uh, studied finance here in, 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 in Germany or, or abroad. And uh, that is, uh, uh, I think, what is really relevant to get diversity in the company. Yeah, because at the end, uh, uh, bankers always had the tendency uh, to think that we are re doing a really, really important thing for customer. And I think that is not the case. That's interesting. Yeah? Because people, uh, people are not interested in banking at all. Yeah? They want to buy a kitchen, they want to buy a car, that they, but they do not want to, bank to do banking at the weekend. And, uh, and so far to get also diversity in, in, the, in the mindset of the people and to get other people really, really thinking in the how do users um, see a technology or a new application. And that's a completely different mindset. Bankers try to make think, uh, things complex. And our job at the end is to make it convenient to the customer. And convenience will be uh, more important than digitization. Digitization is a way to go there. Um, and uh, and uh, security is very important. But if people at the end have to decide uh, the customer for convenience or security, I'm going to bet they always go for convenience. And our job as risk managers or regulators is to have the minimum, minimum level of, uh, of security. And you can always do more. But uh, convenience is going to win. What about Google? Do you hire bankers? for your financial services activities? Uh, I, I'm one example where they did, but uh, um, yes. <laughs> com coming back to your, to, to your talent question, I think uh, talent is definitely key and probably uh, Google has a certain advantage that, that we probably are able to attract a lot of talent uh, overall, even though uh, uh, other startups which are younger might be even more interested for some type of people. But I think it's a question beyond that, I think. I mean, we talked about business models, how heterogeneous or homogeneous uh, future business models will be. And uh, I have a strong belief it's going to be more heter heterogeneous and uh, partnering is key. Yeah. And uh, I think you cannot attract all the talent for the future business model of banking. You have to partner smartly with the right, right companies. Uh, and, and, and even we know that, right? So with, with Google Pay, we have a pa payment uh, solution, but this is very uh, in close contact with banks. We cooperate with banks. We don't even buy, uh, build our own transaction platform. We use actually MasterCard or Visa and the banking platforms to do payments, but we do offer a good uh, front end and user, user experience, uh, uh, and but, but we don't do it all alone. I think that's, that's also true for banks in the future. I think the partnering, yeah. how to partner, uh, uh, what, what, to what skills to build yourself and what not is probably key. Yeah, yeah. What about the cooperative sector? Do you see big changes in your people strategy and your talent management? Um, I mean, there are, there are great challenges. Um, I think we need to hire the great data scientist but especially in the times which might come over the next year to have a very good credit analysts and restructuring people might also help because if you have a restructuring case, uh, your dying sci scientist doesn't, doesn't help you a lot, especially in corporate banking, might be different retail banking. But for us, it's, it's a huge challenge. The whole cooperative organization has 180,000 employees of which 150,000 in cooperative banks and 30,000 in the Z-Bank group. So we have not only uh, Frankfurt, Munich, Stuttgart, uh, talent management and uh, uh, employer branding challenge, but we have it also regionally. And um, as a rule of thumb, in normal times, looking back to the 80s, when there were, there were around per traineeship at the normal cooperative banks, there were around 50 direct applications, 50. Um, so the, the, the reputation of the industry was also in a different status than today. 
so we had um, 50 applications and as a rule of thumb this went down to maybe 10 or 15. Uh, it's due to demography, it's due to the reputation um, and it's uh, also due to the whole setup and the priorities of the, of the new generations, call it YZ and whatever. So for us um, it's important um, that talent management has been an active management discipline, which hasn't been before maybe in the last 20, 25 years ago. I think it was McKinsey to declare the war for talents 20 years ago, and, and now it's there, and it's quite sharp uh, for all job profi profiles that we need in the end. And if the economy remains stable for the next five years, Mr. Hufeld, will we then have to ensure the financial stability of this country with CX designers and agile coaches in banks? Well, uh, you know, believe it or not, but even the public authority like Waffin does attract excellent talent, and, and, and which, which is one more reason to make his life more miserable in that regard, because <laughs> uh, for the past 10 years, in a way post-crisis, believe it or not, we have seen um, a significant increase of a profile of qualifications, um, starting with young women, but young men are following suit who just want to be with the good guys. Um, so we do benefit from all sorts of changes. Um, some of them have been mentioned right here. And so I'm extremely intrigued by the fact that that changes we try to make as a public authority, which provides, of course, other challenges than major uh, private institutions. Um, uh, trying to, to stay, to be attractive um, uh, for young talents. So, knock on wood, uh, so far, um, we are rather on the positive side of things so, so far. Hopefully, it ch doesn't change. The other aspect to it, which you rightly touched upon, is what kind of profiles are we looking for? What, what know-how profiles, what skills do we need? And that indeed is changing both on the private side as well as on our side as well. You know, my, my favorite sort of metaphor to, to, to describe the change it, it is like the, the good old-fashioned mechanics constructing a car moving to mechatronics uh, because it's become a quite different business to create a car. So what are mechatronics in a supervisory context? Um, so we, and we do that, of course, we have to spell out different uh, profiles of competencies which we need today in five years in ten years down the road and talking about data and, and, and data management we haven't really touched upon the whole area of machine learning artificial intelligence and so forth which is a very very powerful trend in fact Baffin will, will publish a report on that in two or three weeks time a very comprehensive report close to 200 pages or so dealing with uh, such phenomenon and yes, indeed, I mean, um, since we insist and in you can do a lot in your, in your institution on artificial intelligence and outsource a lot of things, but you can't outsource responsibility. Um, so if that's true, then we as a supervisor have to stay in a position to actually effectively uh, apply oversight to those sorts of things. So if that is sort of a nice little black box doing anti-money laundering things based on uh, programming codes, um, we need people who actually can read and make judgment, supervisory judgment on stuff which is going to be a very natural thing within the next so and so many years. Um, and, and yes, indeed, we have to find the right talent. But to be honest, um, from, uh, from our po point of view, um, it probably means that we just have to find smart people and then develop such people into something we need because the blend of supervisory knowledge and IT and data knowledge doesn't really exist out there. So it has to be homegrown and we simply need to stay attractive enough to, to get sort of the, if I may say so, in a loving fashion, uh, the raw material at which, which which finds it attractive to go to, to an institution like Baffin. Yeah, yeah, very interesting, very interesting. So I think we touched upon a number of interesting topics. Uh, I uh, uh, heard a lot about new capabilities for the financial service industry, new opportunities. Uh, the strengthening of responsibility was mentioned. Uh, so that should, us, should give us confidence for the future. Ed, I think we should maybe open up the floor for a few 
questions from the audience, if that's OK. There's a question over there. Can we have a microphone? <laughs> oh, that came as a surprise, I'm afraid. <laughs> So microphone is coming. Die Akustik hier oben ist extrem schlecht. Die, wir bräuchten hier zwei, drei ja. Lautsprecher, die das zurückbringen. Die habe ich verstanden, sonst ja. habe ich niemand von der Firma verstanden. Das muss man den Organizers mal sagen. Das kann er wohl gesagt Hallo, Hallo. Gunnar Stammer. Actually noted down two questions, if, if I may. Uh, how does the panel feel, and especially Mr. Hufeld, that... Um, Sparkassen are handing over the, the, the final client contact and uh, the client data to a non-European company uh, that's becoming more and more a near bank. Uh, that's my first question. The second question goes to Mr. Geilen. Um, in your agile teams, are you overburdening the young, digitally active uh, new employees and neglecting your experienced uh, product managers? Or how do you keep your teams small and agile? Thanks. May I suggest, we, because we had a number of shows of hands, that we start with the first question and then see if other uh, uh, folks wanted to ask questions and then maybe come back to the quest second question. Is that OK, Mr. Ufeld? Yes. Um, I think it has been mentioned before by Mr. Guyan that the PSD2 is much more of a game changer than many other pieces of regulation. And that is indeed opening the door of third party uh, payment service providers of all kinds to actually access data um, of any particular bank. So banks are obliged by law now to provide the famous API interfaces um, to anybody who himself or herself has to be notified or licensed, of course, by a supervisor, um, providing payment services. So um, just herding uh, your own client data by political will, and this is a completely neutral statement, um, has been indeed broken up. Um, and that is a game changer, um, for sure. Uh, and it will have implications um, on the perception of millions of clients, which I think haven't been really thought through yet, because most clients, although they have to give consent to that sort of handing over, in theory, and in practice as well, but I would propose that most of such clients don't really understand what that means. It's like me scrolling down and I agree to the latest update of Google or something like that, you know? I mean, I never read it, I don't understand it, I just click I agree, um, like everybody else. Um, and so if something happens, something unpleasant happens, some misuse happens, because we thought I give my data to Volksbank X, Y, Z, whom I know for 25 years, and I know I can trust them. But by means of PSD2 and API, it goes to somebody else, of course, I've never heard about, and something goes wrong. That'll, will, that'll create a whole new set of challenges. Um, and the blame will, of course, go to the Volksbank and, and you guys, um, and, or anybody else, ING or, or whoever, not to a smallish provider coming from wherever. And, and I think that, that'll be a very steep learning curve for all of us. But, you know, promoting innovation, uh, the political world to open up that traditional structures has been very strong, and now we have to deal with it. So, I'm, I'm, again, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm not anti-PSD2 or anything like that. I think it'll open up totally new horizons on, on how financial services are being provided. But, yes, indeed, it'll provide new challenges for all of us to, to keep that safe in a way. Yeah. I think there were questions over here as well. Yeah, there's a question over here. Andreas Povel. Um, one question to President Hufeld. Um, we have an ongoing um, regulation in the United States uh, with regard to the Dodd-Frank Act. And, uh, Yes, the United States has been more regulated maybe than in the European banking uh, world, uh, but uh, do you share the view of the President uh, 
uh, Disselblom that um, there is no regulation uh, to foreseen in the European uh, community or even in uh, Germany. Uh, and how can then uh, German banks or European banks compete on a global base? All right. Um, <laughs> first of all, I don't share the perception that there has been more regulation in the US than in the EU. I think the, it's the other way around. Um, the US has chosen very deliberately the path that, that the utmost slash global regulation is only applied to a small group of banks, and the vast majority of banks are just subject to local regulation to start with. That is different in the EU. The EU has chosen a path to have a single rule book for each and, every, each and every bank. That's the reason why we feel so strongly, and I might say so, even we as regulators, on the need to be proportional. Um, so you can go down the path to apply uh, global regulation to every single bank if you have a well enough spread uh, a toolbox of proportionality built in. If you don't do that, you overburden particularly small banks. And that's exactly the reason why we, together with uh, Bundesbank and, and the Ministry of Finance, have uh, started a very important initiative of proportionality. So am I concerned about level playing field? Well, you know, first of all, I think for the larger banks in the US, the uh, the deregulation is much less than what they hoped for. Um, secondly, um, national interest has always been part of international or global regulation with or without the latest changes in the US. So if, um, if from a competitive point of view, um, in a way, hardball is going to be played, it didn't need the latest um, changes on Dodd-Frank, to uh, trigger those sorts of uh, competitive forces. So to cut a long story short, I'm relatively relaxed about that. Um, those things comes in, come in waves, you know, they come and go. Um, what should not change is a fundamental sense of multilateralism and the commitment to stick to talking to each other and find common ground. And that has not yet been broken, um, contrary to certain people's perception, and I'm extremely grateful for that. Mr. Hufeld, being relaxed is probably a good keyword uh, to move over to the next item on the agenda, which is the coffee break, right? Uh, so yes, being sorry. mindful of the time, let's uh, thank very much the uh, <laughs> panelists here for a great discussion. Thank you.